Hello everybody, welcome to another video. Today is the 15th of March, and today we're going over the Ukrainian border raids that started on the 12th of March going into today. And we're going to go through a timeline of events, looking at the four attack axes that the Ukrainians have launched. And if we're going to be specific about the elements that the Ukrainians are utilizing, the operations themselves are largely being directed by the GUR, which is Ukraine's main intelligence directorate. And the actual soldiers on the ground that are conducting many of the attacks are from groups that I'll go over right now. The Russian Volunteer Corps, that's one group. You have the Siberian Battalion and you have the Freedom of Russia Legion. And so these three groups, they're primarily comprised of Russians that are now living in Ukraine who are opposed to the Putin government. There's some debate as to really the size because, for instance, the Freedom of Russia Legion, they claim to have two battalions, but there's really not enough visual evidence from the photos they've released to verify that. And some of these units, they are rather small, like the Siberian Battalion. It's not the size of a battalion. It's the size of a company, for instance. But either way, they're the ones that have been involved in a lot of these assaults. And it's not the first time that they've been attacking into Russian territory. They've been stationed for a while now on the border between Sumy and Kursk Oblast, and then also Kharkiv and Belgorod Oblast, respectively. And last year, there were pretty similar sort of raids in March and May of 2023 into some villages along the borders. And a lot of those same villages are now being attacked. But this time around, it is at a much larger ferocity and so we're going to get into all the details of how and also the timing itself being right before the beginning of the russian elections which are supposed to start today actually on the 15th of march and then by the 17th of march and so the russians actually had foreknowledge of this ukrainian operation and that's because on the 10th of march there was a very similar incident where the Russian forces spotted an accumulation of Ukrainian equipment in what they reported to be generally around the Gryvoron direction. Gryvoron is a village on the Russian side of the border that the Ukrainians have tried attacking in the past. And so even by the 10th of March, there was an accumulation of Ukrainian forces from the Arton Special Forces Unit of the GUR. They had been provided with tanks self-propelled guns, MLRS systems, infantry fighting vehicles, and machine guns. And they try to use the force in the region because as you can see in this part of Sumi Oblast, or this might be in Kharkiv Oblast, or it's in Sumi, but either way, in both those regions, there are a lot of forested areas on the border with Russia. And so that was used to a certain extent as camouflage, but nonetheless, the Russian forces were able to spot the Ukrainian equipment as it made its way to the border. And the Russians claim to have destroyed five Ukrainian tanks, three SPGs, one MLRS system, plus some infantry fighting vehicles and trucks. This is not completely backed up by the video footage. The video footage does show some destruction to vehicles. And it also does verify that there was a Russian Iskander strike that destroyed a 2S-22 Bohdana self-propelled howitzer. And so that definitely happened. And it gave Russia the ability to, you know, prepare for several days for the Ukrainian operations. Just to get a general idea that there was going to be a ramping up of Ukrainian attacks. I'm not saying they knew exactly where and when it would happen. But they did have a general idea that it was ramping up. And that is also evidenced by the fact that over the past few weeks, the Russian forces have been releasing video footage of the special forces operating, not just around Sumy and Kharkiv, but also further north around Chernihiv Oblast, where some of their forces have been involved in clashes with Ukrainian troops that are getting closer to the border in the forested regions. And so they released some footage of those operations about two weeks ago. But in any case, if we're looking at the Ukrainian side and of course, with their allies in the three units that I described in the beginning of the video. One of their main attack axes was around the village of Tedkino. They opened up this attack around the 12th of March. And to be honest, the unit doing this, which is the Freedom of Russia Legion, they did not provide any 
real concrete evidence that they were able to get control or even get a solid foothold in the village. And again, this is the closest possible village to the front line when you look at this general area. And if you look at where the videos are posted by this unit, it's mainly just the Freedom of Russia Legion utilizing its FPV drones or artillery resources to strike Russian targets in the village, which is in its own right, you could say a success, but then on the other hand, it means that they're not in control of the village. So for instance, I'll go through some of that. Here you have that unit shelling, what they claim to be a radio electronic warfare system. In the center of the village, there was also some pretty heavy shelling on the 12th of March with the Ukrainians targeting a Russian BTR in the center and also two Russian BMDs as they were trying to organize a defense of the village. And so there definitely was, uh, there were some squads from the Legion that attacked in this direction, but they were not able to establish room control. The Russian forces that mainly consist of the Ahmad special forces that were moved in as reinforcements, but even beforehand, the Russian uh, National Guard, they were stationed around this section of the front line, and they are the ones that have been involved in clearing out the Ukrainian resistance. They've had a lot of assistance from the Russian Air Force, and so some of that can be seen in footage that was released from the 14th of March, which shows a pretty sizable Ukrainian infantry squad withdrawing from Tetkino. They got into their vehicles and they started driving away from the southern parts of the village, crossing back into the Ukrainian-controlled Rzhivka. And speaking of Rzhivka, there was a photo released on the 13th of March by the Freedom of Russia Legion. They pictured themselves in Rzhivka, but claimed that it was proof of them capturing Tetkino. And so by now, I think most of you know about this incident. But either way, it does verify that the Ukrainian forward-most position is likely around Rzhivka, and recently around the 14th, the Russian forces were able to fully expel them. But now, as of like the early morning with the 15th, there are new reports circulating of renewed Ukrainian attacks, not, not just in this part of the front line, but also in other villages that is going on right now in the southern section of the village. Now, looking at one of the larger Ukrainian attack vectors that is going on from the village of Popivka, to the Russian village of Spodiarushino. So again, around the 12th of March, Russian forces, this time primarily from the Russian Volunteer Corps, they begin their assault from Popivka in this direction. They also launched an assault from the southern flank, advancing through these open fields, trying to put additional pressure on what they imagine would be a smaller Russian garrison at the moment of their initial assault. But in any case, the Ukrainian column that was advancing and crossing through the border, it ended up being targeted by Russian airstrikes and artillery directed by the National Guard. And so this failed assault by what we call the RDK. was It occurred just to the northwest of this Ukrainian village, Oleksandrivka, and it led to the destruction of two IMR2s, a BMP-1 and a T-72 tank. And when you look at the sort of equipment that these Russian uh, units that are fighting in cooperation with the GUR were given, a lot of them were using M113s, YPR 765s, uh, using some of that Western weaponry, and then also utilizing the Soviet era tanks, T64, 72s, or 80s in some cases. And so initially, the Russian forces were forced to withdraw from some of their positions in that village, given the ferocity of the Ukrainian assault and simply the fact that it is that close to the line of contact. But upon withdrawing, calling in reinforcements, and then getting the involvement of the Air Force, they were able to successfully target a large number of the squads that crossed over the border. They also themselves resisted using heavy machine gun fire, RPGs, small arms fire, of course. And then in the aftermath of all of this, the Russian MOD, they released footage of dozens of dead and wounded, either Ukrainians or Russians, depending on who was assaulting, but they were fighting on the Ukrainian side, from Popivka to Spodaryushino. And in those uh, photos or videos that were released by the Russian forces, it's all red drone footage, probably recorded in the fields that are either to the west of the village or to the south of it. 
and it does show that there were pretty heavy casualties for the attacking side. And again, they were attacking in pretty large numbers in a pretty concentrated manner, which made them more exposed to the Russian artillery strikes. And that also exacerbated casualties. So although on the 12th and the 13th, there were some pretty heavy clashes with the Ukrainian side, by now it does seem like the Russian forces solidified control over this direction. But as I said, on the night of the 14th, the Ukrainians did ramp up their attacks yet again. And so some of these areas that are directly on the border may turn into a gray zone again. Something that is pretty interesting that was reported on the night of the 14th, starting with Russian sources on Telegram and then spreading to larger ones like Rybar, is that there was at least one Ukrainian helicopter that landed in the Russian village of Kozinka and dismounted Ukrainian infantry in the northwestern corner of that village, so around this blue rectangle. And by now, Russian sources were claiming they were able to repel that attack. They claimed that the helicopter, it started off in Kharkiv before making its way to here, and that there are still clashes that are uh, now ongoing in the southern section of the village. And so that's now become a new gray zone, especially along this Grivaron border checkpoint. And so I'm, I'm completely unsure as to whether any of these claims are true because there's no visual evidence yet. And it is something that just happened or uh, the news of it just broke. So we'll have to wait and see if there is any truth to those statements. A large issue for the assaults launched in these directions is the lack of artillery support. Of course, around Tetkino, for instance, there was on the first day a certain level of support for the operations when they targeted the Russian groupings as they were organizing. That is true. But in the three other attack axes, I looked for footage. There is really a lack of strike footage on either Russian infantry or Russian systems that are being moved or closer to the front line. And on the other hand, we have the Russian forces just throughout the entirety of the battle expending artillery targeting Ukrainian groupings that are pretty close together. And it is just a massive mismatch, which shouldn't be happening for a side that is trying to go on the offensive if it's the Ukrainian side attacking towards the Russians, who, by the way, have defended positions on the border between uh, Sumy, Kharkiv, and Belgorod, and Kursk. And that, if it's true that there was a helicopter, could explain why there would even be a helicopter landing. If it were to be true, then it would probably be in order to bypass some of those Russian fortified areas that are directly near the border. But what we did see a lot of over the past three days are Ukrainian drone strikes. We saw a lot of them mainly on targets that are near the border. And a lot of them we don't have any damage for. Like we don't see any aftermath damage for Russian equipment. So a lot of them may have either been intercepted or landed in an open area or within just some of the residential sections of these uh, various villages. There was an apparent Ukrainian drone strike on Grivaron, which was geolocated to the section over here. And there are various other videos of explosions, of fires that were just, uh, that were just caused probably by drone strikes in various other larger towns near the border, reaching towards the Belgorod direction. Another one that's pretty infamous is around Shebekino, where there is a power station and so really keep an eye out for those areas because really you, the Ukrainians have been trying to compensate for their lack of shells by just launching en masse these drone strikes, these drone attacks. They've not been able to degrade the Russian uh, military so far. There were actually 60 or so launched on a single day on the 13th. And so if you extrapolate from that, then it's probably over 100 drones that were launched on this part of the front line for these operations since the beginning on the 12th of March. Another significant attack axis for the Ukrainians was around the village of Nechotivka. The Ukrainian attack over here was led by the Siberian Battalion. And in one such incident where they were attacking, which was filmed on a video from the 12th, it occurred along the road that goes through the border crossing into uh, Russia. And you could see that in that video, I have a link on my map, the T-64 is abandoned after running over a mine, actually on the Ukrainian side of the border. So it may have been a mine laid by the Ukrainians that it ran over accidentally. 
And then at that point, it was also targeted by the Russian anti-tank fire and then eventually by the Ahmad special forces that were moving to this area to hold the line, which they did. And then at that point, their drone crews, they were operating in the skies and they dropped a grenade over this specific T-64, destroying it. And more generally, this entire uh, road leading into Nechotivka, for instance, but also onto the highway, which if you look at it, leads directly to the western parts of Belgorod. Generally, it's turned into a funnel because a lot of Ukrainian vehicles, a lot of Ukrainian infantry have been relying on it as a vector to cross through the border and set up a base on the Russian side. And it has just become very difficult because it is such a narrow area. It is an area that's filled with a lot of mines planted by both sides. And it's also a great spot for the Russians to expend firepower. So we have already seen footage from the Russian side showcasing fab strikes on Ukrainian infantry as they were stationed in some of these buildings on the border checkpoints. And there's not a lot of uh, cover besides these checkpoints. And so all of the cover is just in one specific area. And so the Russians have had the opportunity to just continue pummeling it over and over again. And that has also prevented the Ukrainians from organizing their forces and attacking further northwards towards an area like Nechotivka. And so it's not under Ukrainian control for now, likely given the uptick in attacks on the night of the 14th. It's probably still in a gray zone with the Russian forces generally stabilizing the situation. And as all of these Ukrainian attacks are ongoing, they have been moving a large amount of equipment closer to the front line. And they've been doing this through various logistical hubs that are only, again, several, kilom several kilometers away from the border. And so on one similar sort of action, there was a Russian MLRS strike on Novodimitrivka. This again, was acting as a sort of logistical node. Again, there's a lot of force in the area, could be used as concealment for the equipment as it's being moved closer. But it, and for the Ukrainians, they were spotted and targeted in these strikes. The warehouse were targeted in this video. And then in the similar video footage that was released from this village over here, the Russian forces, they recorded three Bradleys, they claimed they were Bradleys, that were driving in the direction of Popivka to potentially get involved in the fighting over there and so there's been claims about the destruction of bradley's by russian sources in the battles around Popivka, but so far i haven't seen any video confirmation so we'll have to wait and see if those allegations are correct and lastly there was a ukrainian infiltration attempt around novaya tavaljanka and this did have initial success. The Russian sources did admit that the Ukrainians gained a foothold. But in the time since then, they were not able to expand their attacks towards an area like Shebikino. And eventually, the Russian reinforcements arrived. And in a very similar vein to what occurred in the three other attack axes, the Ukrainians were fired upon. They were forced to withdraw. And the line sort of stabilized. And so to look into the future, the Russian Volunteer Corps, the RDK, they released a statement on the 14th saying that they were going to give a certain sort of humanitarian pause that would allow the civilians that are along the border between Ukraine and Russia to evacuate further northwards within, you know, Belgorod Oblast mainly. And so he, they said basically that by 7 a.m. they would restart their offensive activities in implication that the operations that we, I just described over the past three days would restart by tomorrow morning right now it's already 15th but you know you could say that it's in like six and a half hours or five and a half hours by now if we're looking at ukrainian time in terms of when these attacks are supposed to restart but really if we're looking at the results of the first three days when the ukrainians were supposed to at least have the element of surprise when they could construct the battlefield in the way that would be most conducive for their forces to occupy land and target Russian systems. Now the Russian forces have already moved in reinforcements. They're already expending a large amount of their aerial assets and uh, of course artillery targeting the Ukrainian side that is trying to advance through various open areas or various choke points that are filled with mines, filled with fortifications. With all that being said, I can't see how, even if the attacks were ramped up, that it would go any differently than they were when very similar assaults were launched over the past three days or launched last year 
2023. But the concrete battlefield success is not the only interest for the Ukrainians, of course, as we look at the timeline, seeing that today the elections in Russia starts, of course, parts of why this is being done, especially with these Russian units, is in order to give the Russian citizens, especially located on the border, the feeling that Putin is responsible for bringing the war directly to them, that he's not able to protect his borders, that the war is not negatively affecting the civilians in Russia. And of course, people are not expecting that this would be enough to make any sort of substantial change to the election. But at least the hope would be, from thinking through the Ukrainian perspective, would be to create enough internal pressure and commotion regarding the situation that it could cause political issues for Putin when it comes to his own interests in furthering the war in Ukraine. That would at least be the Ukrainian mindset when they're doing this. There is also, of course, sentimental effect of being able to take photos within Russian territory, you know, the sort of effect that it could have on the Russian citizenry, the Ukrainian citizenry to improve morale or, or on Western audiences. But re really, in any case, there is, of course, the concrete military perspective, which is sending in, even if these Russian units that are attacking into Russian territory are pretty small in size, Again, they claim to be two battalions, for instance, the Freedom of Russia Legion, which I don't even know if that's true. But, you know, still, if you have several hundred Russian forces, several hundred troops that are uh, combat capable, that do have equipment that was provided by the West or was in earlier Ukraine inventory, that being expended on offensive activities that are really bound to fail and bound to uh, be decimated by the Russian firepower, as we've been seeing in these geolocated videos, it really is a waste of those resources that could definitely be used elsewhere as we look at the front line. We look at areas where the Ukrainians would need additional shells, additional vehicles, additional men that would all be deeply appreciated by the units working on those sectors, but instead they were sent northwards to the fighting on the Russian border to open up a new attack vector. And so um, it's not directly related, but it is just a microcosm of what I was just describing. But today, actually, the Russian forces were able to advance in Berdichy. And part of this is due to the fact that recently the Russian forces launched new attacks on the villages of Pervomyska and Nevelska. And that spread out the Ukrainians in the sector of the front line because they have to defend, of course, against the area to the west of Avdivka to prevent a further Russian advance westwards and at the same time they're trying to prevent the Russian forces from, from completely closing in on the pocket that is forming around Pervomyska and towards Natalove. And so the Ukrainian units defending over here, especially the 53rd Mechanized Brigade and other units that are really split in their duties, split on which parts of the battlefield they're defending, they have again been spread out thin by this and this has given the Russians the opportunity to continue pushing deeper into Berdichy. So no longer are the Ukrainians counterattacking. Now the situation is stabilized. The Russians have been able to hold back those Ukrainian counterattacks. And now we finally have images of the Russian forces getting deeper into Berdichy. And so we have one such video showing uh, over here on market actually. It's a video from the 47th Mechanized Brigade. And so again, they of course do still have the defensive capabilities that is evident based on the video footage they provide. And so in this video, the 47th, they claim to have destroyed three Russian armored personnel carriers. And you could see that in the video, artilleries and FEVs and actually also Bradley infantry fighting vehicles are targeting those uh, Russian APCs. And the location is important because it is past the Durna River, the Durna River if you look at the map, it's marked over here. Very narrow river, but it is the geographical uh, geographic obstacle that the Ukrainians have been hoping would slightly protract the fighting to the east of the fortifications being built up around the village of Simonivka. But now the Russian forces have already established a foothold to the west of that river. And now they're undermining the defense of Berdichy because no longer do the Ukrainians control southern Berdichy. As far as geolocations are concerned, the Ukrainians only have a confirmed presence in the northern section of that village. 
And so that's all I have for today. Thank you all for watching, and I'll see you guys in the next video. Goodbye.